and I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. And uh, we are, I guess, the primary and initial instigators of this event that we're very excited about, primarily through a new initiative we have called the Sustainable Development Initiative. Now, what happened is we uh, applied for a Title VI National Resource Center grant, which is on a four-year cycle. We're pleased to, uh, to say that we got renewed and uh, part of the renewal application included this new uh, initiative that we're calling the Sustainable Development Initiative, which we're just kind of getting off the ground this year. And uh, that initiative will have a number of different components, but one of the primary ones is uh, reflected in tonight's event, and that is to use our center as a space for uh, growing awareness of our consumer habits and the way that we are interconnected socially materially, geographically, with Latin American Caribbean peoples. And so, uh, due to the efforts primarily of Dr. Catherine Tucker and Dr. Hillary Kahn, uh, Dr. Uh, Dean Saigon is here this semester in large part to help us uh, kick off this new Sustainable Development Initiative. I want to uh, mention a couple of our co-sponsors, uh, the Department of Anthropology, the Foster International Living and Learning Center, directed by John Velasco. We're very happy to have John's collaboration as well as Blooming Foods. And tomorrow I would note for you that there's going to be an informal discussion open to the public in the Foster Shade Ground Floor Lounge uh, on Fee Lane. Um, as I said, uh, one part of the context for this event this evening is the fact that uh, Catherine Tucker and Hillary Kahn are teaching courses this semester in which they have combined efforts uh, to, uh, to study the way that coffee is consumed uh, on campus and around campus. Uh, environmental anthropology with, uh, with Catherine Tucker and, uh, and uh, Human Rights and the Arts, an international studies, studies course with Dr. Hillary Kahn. And so uh, again, the, that provides part of the context for this visit uh, by Dean Seikai. And I'm now going to turn it over to Professor Catherine Tucker of the Department of Anthropology, whose own research deals with, in part, coffee production in Honduras and Mexico and other places and who also, in addition to the aforementioned environmental anthropology course, teaches a course on coffee production and consumption and circulation. So thank you, Catherine. We'll, we'll introduce our speaker this evening. Awarded the gold medal as the best travel essay book in 2008. 
so he has wide experience, and one of the great things about Dean's Beans is that it shows that you can have a business that helps people, that does good things, that makes a difference in the world, and is still profitable. So I look forward to hearing what he has to say. Thank you. I'll tell you when. Thank you. I'm not much of a stand behind the podium kind of guy, so uh, it must be all that coffee. So I'll, I'll just be doing some wandering. Okay, what, um, what I'd like to do for tonight, you know, I, guys, come on up. It's, you'll see the slides better. The slides are much more important than I am. So why don't you come on? I'm not going to call on anybody, I promise. I know you got that knee jerk Indiana University reaction to sitting too close to the profs and all that sort of thing, but come on, it's much more fun up here. I promise. Besides, the numbers for the giveaway are only under the first five uh, rows to find out if you win, okay, the trip to Honduras, but... By the way, is, the, is this working? Is this working for you? Okay. Great, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, also, I guess we're filming, so we don't want to take the lights down too far, but can everybody see the slides relatively? All right. Um, yeah, all right. If we could dim them, that'd be great. If it's going to interfere with filming, you know, we'll sacrifice for the arts. All right. Just a little bit so that there's more groovy. Okay, that's good. Whatever. Even better. Oh, now it's like a French cafe. This is getting better all the time. Okay, Bradley, hit it. Uh, Matt, thanks. Okay, what I'm, what I'm gonna do is just let these slides go behind me. These are images of life in the coffee lands. And I, I could spend the whole night just telling you what these slides are. They're from the 14 countries I work in at present. And um, they illustrate the lives of the coffee farmers, uh, the lives of their communities, and, uh, and many of the social issues that uh, coffee farmers face. Um, I just think these images tell a much more in-depth tale than I could. And so just enjoy them. Every now and then I'll turn and I'll refer to like being on a boogie schooner off the coast of Java carrying coffee bags, um, you know, pickers and in, in a young girl picking coffee in Nicaragua, et cetera. I'll, I'll refer every now and then, but basically it's just to let you know what the world of coffee is like. Because inside every cup of coffee that we drink in the morning, there are worlds upon worlds of custom, of culture, of struggle, of hopes, of every major issue in the 21st century, every issue of globalization is inside that coffee cup. And yet every morning we drink that cup, don't even give it a thought, okay? Inside that coffee cup are women's rights, indigenous uh, self-determination, environmental struggles, war and peace, uh, youth movements, environmental issues, ecological issues, and uh, economic issues. It's all there. Uh, disabilities rights, we'll talk about that in a bit too. It's all there. Uh, immigration, it's all there. Being played out around the world in the 80 countries around the equator between the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, 30 degrees north and south of the equator, where the coffee of the world is grown. And it's my joy and pleasure to work in these countries. Let me be frank. I love to travel, I love languages, I love getting tattoos, I won't show you right now, maybe after dinner tonight, but I always, if it's appropriate to the culture, I always get a tattoo. So my, I don't collect postcards, I collect tattoos from all the places I work. So that's lots of fun. And I just love indigenous cultures, indigenous languages, and so part of it is that yes, I'm a believer in social justice and this is my way of of manifesting my belief in social justice. But part of it is I just love to have a good time with the peoples around the world. And my advice to every college student is the same thing. Do what you love, but do it where you want to be and surrounded by people you care about. Most of us get one of those, shoot for all three. I've got all three uh, picking coffee in Rwanda. I get all three and, it, and it's, uh, it's made for a great life. Okay, so Dean's Beans didn't start because I sat in the classroom or I sat in the boardroom and said, I'm going to do this thing and change the world. Dean's Beans was, a, was an, ev an evolution 
of, of my commitment to social justice. I was a lawyer. I got training on Wall Street because that was the belly of the beast to me in the, in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. I was there for three years. I went out on my own and started a one-person law firm doing indigenous rights and environmental law. I starved, but it was great fun and, and important work. I've been doing uh, work on uh, indigenous lands ever since, uh, fighting large-scale extractive industry, doing treaty rights, uh, economic development work, and a whole host of things. So I was giving, um, I was on development projects in India, Iran before the, before the revolution and, and some other countries. And then I found myself teaching part-time while being a lawyer at the University of Rhode Island. I was giving a lecture like this um, about the true causes of deforestation in Brazil. It wasn't about the hamburger highway or this or that. It was really about the 1,000% evaluation in the, in the value of land in the Brazilian Amazon annually. And that generals and business people wanted to grab that land because they could earn so much money just by holding on to it for a year or two and selling it off in parts. And that's what drove Amazonian destruction largely in the 70s and early 80s. So I was giving this talk. Afterwards, a professor comes out of the audience and says, you know, I have a friend here in Providence who has a coffee shop. He buys coffee from Brazil. By the way, social justice can be fun. I was a, I was a, a, a drunken extra in Pirates of the Caribbean 3. You can see me throw up behind Johnny Depp in the last scene of the movie. It's, it's, it makes the movie from an artistic point of view. So um, it's a great story. You can read about it on the website. So uh, the guy comes out of the audience, says, my friend buys coffee from Brazil. He knows the farmers are so poor, he wants to do something to help them, but he doesn't know how. You've been on development work. You work with indigenous peoples. Will, will you meet with him? Will you talk to him? I said, sure. So I went up. We met, and the three of us on the spot decided to form the world's first development organization dedicated to coffee. That was called Coffee Kids. That was in 1988. My role in Coffee Kids, because of my background, was to go into the villages of the world, play soccer, to go into the villages of the world where coffee is grown, meet with people, meet with women's groups, meet with uh, civil society, not government, not churches, just the people themselves, and try to suss out their development priorities. Not so much what do you need, as my way of framing it in, in my, my version of development work is what's holding you back? What are the roadblocks that are holding you back as a community and as a family from realizing your goals? So having those kind of conversations, which is sometimes called appreciative listening, there's all sorts of buzzwords around it, but basically it's hanging out with people, respecting them and listening to them, and I'll get into that a little more later. So from that, we would, we would create development projects that would address the needs as expressed by the people. Then I would go back and we would get large companies around the country or small companies to contribute to Coffee Kids to pay for the development work. Standard, by the way, that's the birthplace of coffee. That's where the first coffee plants were found in Ethiopia. It doesn't look exciting. I expected there to be like an amusement park or tourism thing, Kaldi Land, named after the goat herd who found coffee, but nothing, just a hillside. They need a little help on the marketing in Ethiopia. Okay, so, um, so we started Coffee Kids, and my role was to create the development work. The other guy's role was to get Starbucks, Green Mountain, everybody else to give us money to do this work. Good, solid, charitable development work, standard mainstream development work. Not bad, helpful. But one day, I was sitting, um, I was sitting in Guatemala, and we were um, starting a, a small well project. And I was sitting there, and something was bugging me. And I thought, well, the people are getting a well, they're getting fresh water, that's a good thing, so why am I so unhappy? What's going on? And I realized that the company that gave us the $5,000 to build this little well was going to take all the photos. They sent a crew of photographers down. They were gonna take all these photos, not pay the people for the photos, right, as they would have to pay models at 5,000 bucks a clip in New York for a day, but they were gonna take the photos and they were gonna get so much credit from marketing by showing the world what great work they're doing in this village. And yet nothing was changing. The company wasn't changing the way it was doing business. So what was happening is the chronic state of underdevelopment in those villages, which is not the fault of the coffee company, but the coffee company takes advantage of it by sourcing there. The chronic state of underdevelopment in the villages was going to remain. That's the crooked uh, minister of uh, cooperative development in Kenya who got me in the back of his, his air-conditioned Mercedes to take me to a coffee co-op 
and then tried to get me to buy his family's coffee instead of the co-op's coffee and offered me kickbacks and stuff like that. God bless Kenya. It's an amazing country. So, um, so I thought, this doesn't work. And, and not only that, but the company wasn't really paying much money for the coffee. So nothing was changing. So I wondered, what would it look like if a company actually paid real money for the coffee? P.S. This is before fair trade came to the United States. So it wasn't based on a formula. I don't, I don't really believe social justice is a formula. I believe it's a process. Uh, formulas have to be reevaluated constantly to see if they're actually upholding the values that they stand for. I believe in the process. So I thought, what would it look like if a company actually paid real money to the farmers for that product? Could it have a real impact on people's lives? Then the second question was, what would it look like if a company actually took a sense of responsibility for the conditions in the countries, in the villages where it was sourcing its raw materials? Instead of just buying them and walking away, what would it look like if the company took a sense of responsibility for those conditions and, and worked with the people to change things? Again, I don't feel that I or the West is necessarily responsible for poverty around the world. I don't want to go that far. But the chronic states of underdevelopment caused by hundreds of years of unfair trade, of horrid local governments and corruption and hierarchy, by ethnic and, and racial tensions and hierarchy in those countries. There's plenty of reasons why people are poor. But the question is, if I'm buying in those countries, if I'm buying with those folks, is there something that I can do as a business that can make a better relationship, a better life for them? Uh, and frankly, I know it sounds corny to say this, but truly make the world a better place. Really bring improvement to people's lives. And frankly, another thing is peace. Uh, I really believe that the work I do is, is as an ambassador of peace, both for America, which we need it desperately to counter the boots on the ground thing that we do all over the world, and also just, just it, to show that the human condition can be about positive actions on all sides. So, that, and there's the well. There's the well in Guatemala. That picture was the day I decided, okay, let's see, can a company do that? Pay decent money get involved in some way in the lives of the villagers, and could that company be profitable? Because if the company isn't profitable, what do you have? You got Coffee Kids again. You have Oxfam, great organization, but you know, business is by far and away the largest engine of activity on this planet. And until business changes its fundamental operating principles, all we're gonna be doing in social change is fighting brush fires now and then and trying to make the best of a bad situation, and then the banks crap out, and then the housing market craps out, you know, and what's the next thing that's gonna happen, and the water becomes privatized. Until businesses change their fundamental operating principles, we're really constantly struggling to, to create a better, uh, a better world. So I thought, I wanna do this as a for-profit business to model that business can be uh, an active and positive player for social change and still be profitable. Because if I can do that, then what? Then all those other coffee companies that didn't want to give money to coffee kids because, ah, we're not really very profitable this year, and they were simply lying, all those companies had no more excuse. They would have to either start putting money into things like coffee kids or changing the way they do business. And um, in the 18 years I've been doing this as Dean's Beans, we've had a very profound impact on the coffee industry. And I'm, I'm very proud and humbled by that. So let me get into what it actually looks like, the nuts and bolts of what I'm talking about looks like. The way we operate in the communities that we, we source in, in, in the 13, or was 14, now 13 countries, I stopped working in Kenya, um, the 13 countries we work in, looks like this. There are basically three legs to, to the stool. The first is, is environmental, the second is economic, and the third is social. So let me just take them one by one. The, the uh, environmental leg, well, coffee is the second most heavily pesticided crop in the world after cotton. And cotton uses 50% of the world's agrochemicals. Interesting thing to note, okay? The top 10 pesticides, herbicides, fungicides used on coffee are either banned for use in the United States or the most highly restricted level of usage. 
So what does that mean? We can manufacture those things here, and I'm talking about DDT, malathion, parathion, diendron, paraquat, which we, the, the, um, the uh, US government and the Mexican government sprayed on Mexican pot plants to try to destroy the pot plants years ago and ended up uh, impacting uh, child, uh, child and maternal health. Um, all of these chemicals can be manufactured in the United States and are, but we can't use them here. We can manufacture them here and we can export them to be used on those people. Now, you can be the judge of this, but sometimes when I talk, people say, oh, that's what's called environmental racism because we don't want us upper class white people to be subject to these things, but we don't mind those brown people getting it dumped on them all over the world. And then the curious thing is, of course, with what's called the circle of poison, we manufacture the poison, we export it, and then it comes back to us on the stuff we import. So I've always been concerned about the health impacts in the, in the developing communities I work in because I've seen many communities where kids walk down the rows of coffee plants with a bucket of white powder, DDT, and just take scoops of it with their hand and throw it on the plants. So I've been very concerned about that, and I've never really thought of its impact up here. I gave a talk at MIT a couple of years ago, and a professor came out of the audience afterwards and said, well, you know, you really should be concerned. I said, well, you know, but the, I, I don't want to be overblown about the thing because it, the stuff is on the coffee plant in parts per billion. You know, they spray it in parts per billion, and, and then they strip away the cherry, which is around the pit, which is actually what the coffee seed is that we get. So the red cherry has all the stuff on it, then that's stripped away, and then you know, we dry it in the sun and then we take it up here and we roast it at 460 degrees and then we smash it up and pour boiling water on it. So we did work at, at University of Rhode Island when I was there and we found that it was only parts per billion when it was on the coffee beans that we're drinking here. So, you know, it didn't seem like a big problem. And the professor said, but it is a big problem and here's why. All your life you're taking in these chemicals, these horrible chemicals, at parts per billion and they bioaccumulate in your body fat. This is especially a problem for women because of uh, bioaccumulation in breast tissue. Then as you're older, when you get to be about my hoary age of 58, your body starts to draw down its fat reserves. And that's one of the reasons why if you ever see your grandparents waving goodbye, you see that flabby thing flapping around on the bottom there, right? Because the muscle is being eaten by your body and your fat is being eaten by your body at, a, at an alarming rate as you get older. So what's happening, the professor advised me, is parts per billion are coming in, but as your body starts to, to devour its own fat, parts per million are coming out of, of fat solution. So you're getting these mega hits of serious chemicals. And there's some research being done now that's starting to link later in life issues such as Alzheimer's with this massive explosion of chemicals being released in your body when you're older. So I've always been concerned about the health impacts on, on the communities I work in, and I've since learned that there's something that we have to be concerned about too, even though coffee is so heavily processed before we actually drink it in the cup. Interesting stuff. The other issue um, that's so problematic from an environmental point of view with, uh, with pesticides and coffee especially, by the way, slow down, Indians and animals in the road. That's what that sign said. We talk about racism uh, in different cultures. That was Colombia. And when we drove past that sign, the guy I was with said, we've got a long way to go in Colombia because under the law, under certain aspects of the law, Indians are still animals. Happens in a lot of places in the world. So um, remember, I, I, I don't think I mentioned this. I'm sorry I blew past it. My background is working with indigenous peoples. That's the, my passion. And when we talked about creating coffee kids, I did a little research and I came to realize that the overwhelming majority of coffee growers around the world are indigenous peoples. So to me, I felt like I can make the jump from straight advocacy into this coffee kidsy thing working in these communities because they're the same communities that have the same dynamics, the same issues I've been, I've been dealing with all my, all my professional life. So this is going to be interesting. So what does that mean around the environment? What's fascinating is the uh, international regulations of pesticides require warnings on the bags as they go through export. The warnings are in English, German, and Spanish. Now, n none of the farmers I work with 
reads English or German. Very few read Spanish. The majority of people I work with, as you can see from these slides, are indigenous peoples. They do not speak the majority language. In fact, if you think about what indigenous means, it, it, in a lot of these societies it tends to be, especially where coffee is grown, it's grown in the mountains, not grown in the heart of the capital. The, um, the people live on the periphery of their societies, their, front, their frontier is another term of the trade, but you'll have to correct me because I'm kind of old in my anthropological knowledge, I don't know what the, the current words are, but periphery people, frontier people, they live on that side, that margin of the culture, uh, the political and economic culture of their society. One of the aspects of that is language. So in most communities I work with throughout Central and South America, the farmers don't speak Spanish. So if I go into, um, into Peru, in, in, uh, in Central Peru, they speak Ashanincas, not Spanish. Um, when I go into uh, Northern Peru, they speak uh, Quechua Lamas, not Spanish. When I go into Guatemala, the farmers I work with speak Tsutsuil, Mam, Quiche, Cachiquel, or many other languages. They don't speak Spanish, and they certainly don't read Spanish. The point of it is they cannot adequately read and understand and function within those pesticide warnings. Uh, one aspect is sort of the sociocultural dynamic of indigenousness and international trade, how that works together. Even in, even in uh, this is Rwanda, but even in Ethiopia, uh, the farmers I work with uh, do not speak English and they do not speak Amharic, the national languages. That's because they are not Amharic peoples, they are Oromo. Oromo is the majority uh, tribal peoples in Ethiopia. They're black pastoralists that historically came up from, you know, via Kenya, what was, was now Kenya, came up from, uh, from uh, the south, whereas the Amharic people came in from the north. And there's still quite a tension between Romo and Amharic in, in both society, uh, uh, schooling, and uh, things like farming. This is a, a, a coffee ceremony, which is a daily occurrence in Romo villages. Every coffee farming family starts the day with three small cups of coffee and three separate blessings. And that's, uh, it's the only country in the world that does that because Ethiopia is where coffee was found uh, around the year 700. And so coffee is an integral part of Ethiopian culture as opposed to a place like Guatemala where coffee was brought in by German farmers in the 1840s and it's not a part of indigenous culture. It's a, a crop, an export crop, uh, and frankly a, a slave crop. And it always has been. In Brazil it really was a slave crop for a very long time. So coffee has different relationships to different societies. So that's the, that's the main part of the environmental piece. So what we do with, with farmers is help farming communities get organic certification, get on organic, uh, international organic registry. Now what that might mean is we have to pay for organic certification, which tend to be about $5,000. So we'll do that generally as a loan that comes back to us over time because we have long-term relationships with our communities. Um, or uh, we train, in Kenya, we train the, the first international uh, inspector from Kenya at a cost of $15,000. We brought him to America. He went through an international training course went back and we helped set up uh, organic, Kenyan Institute of Organic Farming. And now just last week, the first organic coffee from Kenya came out. So after a number of years, there's finally some success in that. Um, organic training for farmers is not just not using chemicals. It's a three-year, very detailed process, which requires the cooperatives and the farmers to have really strict uh, systems of monitoring what goes on to their land, uh, of how water is used, how soil is preserved, how uh, agricultural waste becomes nutrition for the soil through composting and mulching. And those are very firm requirements. After three years, a farmer can get certified organic. And that's the difference between certified organic and what you may hear in some uh, local coffee shops, I'm sure, uh, where, where's our friend? Not, not, is it your nephew that has the, so, there he is. Uh, that's right, uh, we have a, a local coffee shop person here. Um, but many, many coffee shops I visit around the country, when I ask them if they have organic coffee, they say, well, all of our coffee is organic. All coffee is organic, and that's simply not true. And even the, the, the lack of use of chemicals is not organic. That's called organic by neglect, as opposed to certified organic, which is organic by design, okay? 
So you have to look for that organic stamp to believe that there's really been a, a, a training program that farmers have gone through. So that's the environmental piece. The economic piece is really important. You know, we talk about free trade for a minute. And, and, and the heart of free trade and neoliberal economic theory is ultimately that you have a willing buyer and a willing seller in an arm's length transaction who are able to come together and decide on a price that they agree on. You know, forget about unfair advantage on both sides. Let's just talk about pure theory. Well, that doesn't happen in the world of coffee. The, the price for coffee, the base price for coffee, is not decided by the farmers. It's not decided by Dean's Beans. It's decided in a, in a room, a, a circular trading room in New York called the New York Board of Trade. And in this trading circle, young, hyper-caffeinated young men, and there, there are very few women involved in this, are on the trading floor just shouting orders to buy, 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 sell, 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 just like on a stock exchange. Coffee futures, they're, they're basically they're they're judging what the price of coffee is going to be the next month and then the following months, right up to a year in the future, based on the intelligence that they get from all sorts of analysts who talk about weather, who talk about politics, who talk about currency floats and exchange rates, and all sorts of information goes in their head, and then they buy and sell coffee futures. That is actually a legitimate activity for businesses who are involved in coffee. Why? Because if you know roughly what you're going to be paying for coffee in the future, you can plan. So for the large producers like Kraft, Nestle's, Maxwell House, having access to those coffee commodity futures is, is very important. But a very strange thing has happened over the last decade. Coffee has become a speculative commodity, especially in the last two years. Why is that? Well, in the last two years, what happened? The banks fell. The mortgage markets fell. All those derivatives and, and currency things all fell apart. That's where the investment banks, the hedge funds, were putting all their money, right? That's where the investments were. When those investments failed, the money went someplace else. And I don't know, uh, there, there should be some agriculture around here, so there's this classic thing about agricultural economics that says when there's a time of economic uncertainty, money flows, investment money flows to commodities. Why? People all have to eat, right? They all need rice, they all need wheat, they all need oil for their cars. Now it's been discovered they all drink coffee. So where coffee was never really a speculative commodity, all of a sudden it is. And what that means is these guys in the trading ring take the ordinary information that the, that the big coffee houses use, such as there's going to be a frost, an early frost in Brazil. Well, what does that mean? Early frost in Brazil, the flowers wilt, the coffee crop will be smaller. Therefore, smaller supply, larger demand, price goes up. Bid, 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 bid the price up, and then the price starts going up as more and more people jump on the bandwagon. Or conversely, if there's a rumor that in, in Indonesia or in, uh, in, in Aceh in northern Indonesia or in Colombia, there's a peace deal being brokered. Well, if there's going to be a peace deal, that means that the farmers will be able to get their coffee out on the roads, their trucks won't be hijacked, therefore there's going to be more Colombian coffee on the market. What does that mean? Higher supply, same demand, price goes down. Sell, 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 sell. So where ordinarily the, the market was what we would call somnambulant, sleepy, a sleepy market where the coffee price only went like this daily, daily basis, now it's a screaming, raging, hormonal commodity market. It's crazy. And the price can skyrocket, you know, 10 cents, 20 cents, 30 cents in a day. The next day it's 40 cents down. Now what does that mean? That's the basis upon which all coffee trading is done. So here's this guy from Village Guatemala. He takes his bag of coffee. He walks down the hill, sits on the road, waits or, or into a marketplace and waits for a trader to come along and buy that coffee, a middleman. Today the guy says, here's 20 cents for the coffee. The farmer goes, 20 cents, okay, walks back to the village. The next day he wakes up, has breakfast, takes that next bag of coffee, walks right down to the same spot, same guy comes along, he says, okay, give me my 20 cents and says, no, I'm sorry, I can only give you 15 cents today. And the farmer says, wait a minute. It cost me the same amount of time, energy, administrative overhead, et cetera, et cetera, 
to grow this bag of coffee as that bag of coffee. How come you're giving me a different price for it? Same quality. He says, oh, the international market's gone down. Okay? So the farmer has no way of having input into pricing. And as, as uh, Tedesse, you've seen a uh, big jolly uh, Ethiopian guy with me in many of these shots. As Tedesse once said to me, we're price takers, not price makers. Coffee farmers are price takers. They have to take the price that's offered to them. Okay? That's the standard market. Now what happens is fair trade has come along and said, you know what? All of these farmers who live on the margins, all these small farmers who have one acre of land, maybe less, or at most an acre and a half, they can't access the market. They can't sell directly. They can't get credit. They can't get information. So they have no way of protecting their own economic interests, certainly no way of bettering their own lives. So what fair trade says is, let's, let's help these farmers, the most marginalized ones, the small farmers around the world, which is about 95% of all farmers. What they do is, they say, okay, farmers, on your side, if you promise to form cooperatives so that your small holdings and your small um, crop every year collectively is much larger, you will have much better access to the market, even direct access to the market. A container of coffee is 40,000 pounds of coffee. A small producer may produce 1,000 pounds. Okay? That producer can't sell directly to the United States or Europe. But if 40 producers of 1,000 pounds each get together, they have a container. Then they can export a container directly. That's very important economically. So if they form co-ops, and the co-ops are democratic and transparent, then they can get on the fair trade registry. Why democratic, why transparent? Good values, good international human rights values. The transparency allows the farmers to know exactly how much money is coming into the co-op, who's getting what, none of this secret stuff like Enron. Everybody knows exactly who's getting what. And I think you saw photos, a couple of photos, of Tedesse and other farmers pointing to the wall with all these figures. Well, those figures were how much a farmer makes, how much that farmer took home, how much that farmer took home. Everybody knows, total transparency. The democratic nature of it is really significant because for the first time in these people's lives, they are having a direct and, and impactful say in the economic and political activities of their lives. So people get very empowered. Another part of, uh, of, of the fair trade uh, program for cooperatives is gender equity. I'm not going to try to sell you a bill of goods. It doesn't happen all over the world, but there are places where gender equity in these co-ops is really taking on uh, uh, a, a powerful dynamic. Uh, five of the four to 14 co-ops I buy from around the world are managed by women. And I don't know any other sector of primary production around the world where, where you can make a claim like that. Um, uh, one person, one vote. Women have to be represented equally on the boards of directors. Um, so there's, there's a real push for gender equity. But again, we've, we've sent students down to try to uh, look at and document gender equity issues in, in, in coffee co-ops and very mixed results. Culturally, I've seen situation in Guatemala where even though there were women on the board of directors, the women only spoke an indigenous language and the men held meetings in Spanish. So the women were just simply frozen out even though they were on the board of directors. So a lot of work yet to do. Uh, hard and interesting social, social work to do. So that's, that's the farmer's side. The farmer's required to form these cooperatives. On our side, anybody who signs a fair trade contract to become a fair trade, not a fair trade company, because theoretically there are no fair trade companies, there's only fair trade coffee. If I sign a contract agreeing to buy fair trade coffee, that means when I buy from these co-ops, I buy under certain terms. The terms are as follows. There's a minimum price. It's not what we pay for coffee. It's only a minimum. Meaning that when that international market price is going up and down and up and down, we fair traders agree we will never pay less than what the farmers and the international coffee community have determined, fair trade community, have determined is a re basically a reasonable living wage for farm families. We'll never pay less than that. When I first started, it was $1.20. Now it's $1.60. Okay, it doesn't sound like much, because you know what you pay for coffee here. But that's, a, I mean, 
from $1.20 to $1.60 is a 30, 40% jump. That's substantial. Anyway, it's, it's a living wage in the coffee communities we work in. But again, that is a minimum, which means when the world market price goes down below $1.60, we agree we'll never pay less. Now, in the years 1999 to 2003, because the first burst of speculation in coffee, that world market price went it went down to 80 cents, it went down to 70 cents, it went down to 60 cents, and one day it bottomed out at 45 cents a pound. That means that every pound of coffee a farmer grew and sold drove that family deeper into poverty because it takes a farmer about 65 cents to process coffee. Okay? So if that farmer takes 65 cents to process it but only gets 40 cents back or 50 cents back, every pound that we bought and we drank was driving someone deeper into poverty. And that's what fair trade seeks to avoid. So when the price goes back up over the dollar sixty, fair traders are required to pay seven cents more than the world market price. Okay? So right now, this morning, I can't believe it, but because of speculation, because of what's going on in the Middle East, because of some speculation about crops in Vietnam and Brazil and all these Brazil ranchers are holding their freezer doors open to try to create a frost in the country to drive the prices up. That's kind of a joke, uh, but probably not. Um, today, the price of coffee on the world market was $2.80. That's that price. That's not, that's not, that's not up here, right? $2.80. Now, considering last year, one year ago, it was $1.40, and that was high because it's usually around a dollar, if even less. Uh, the world coffee price is staggeringly high. <clears throat> For fair trade cooperatives, that's great news. Why? Because that money is being paid directly to the cooperatives. All right? To people who aren't involved in fair trade, it's not such good news because those are the farmers who are selling to the middlemen. And they sell to the other middlemen who sells to the mi miller, who sells to the exporter, who sells to the importer, who sells to the roaster. So an interesting thing happened at an international conference I was at a couple years ago. There was a panel and a guy from Starbucks and a couple other big coffee companies around the world were speaking. And the Starbucks guy said, well, we pay an average of $1.20 to our farmers. This is a couple years ago. And that um, is basically equal to the international, price of uh, international fair trade price. So we don't have to be fair trade because we're already paying roughly the fair trade price on average to the farmers we deal with. And I said, whoa. I have to ask a question, and being polite, because I learned that you can get more flies with honey. I, I used to be a lot uh, ruder than this. But I said, well, excuse me, can we have a clarification? Now, we have to be very careful what we say in the coffee industry because people on the outside don't understand our industry. So, for example, Starbucks, you guys, you're not importers, are you? You don't import your own coffee. They said, no, no, we don't. We use brokers because that way they don't have to have the risk of loss. The broker has it. If it doesn't show up at the brokers, Starbucks doesn't have to pay for it. If you buy direct, like we do, something happens to that container, you know, we're out 80000 or now $120,000. So I said, but you're not importers, so you have to buy through a broker. That's correct. So that dollar twenty actually is what you pay the broker for the coffee. And he said, well, yes, that's root. That's true. I said, okay, so the broker then buys it from an exporter, and maybe adds 20 cents onto it. Yeah, that's true. And then the exporter to the miller, the miller to the middleman, the middleman to the farmer. So basically what you're saying is when you're paying $1.20 to the broker, the farmer's probably getting, meh, maybe 70 cents. And he said, yes, that's right. So I said, so we're talking apples and oranges here. You're making a representation that it's the same as fair trade, but the fair trade money goes directly to the co-op. Your money goes to a broker. And he said, well, yes, that's right. The next day I got a call from Cone Associates, which is a, uh, a marketing firm in Boston, and they're the marketing uh, firm for Starbucks. And they said, will you come into Boston, I, I don't live far from there, and talk to us about this issue. So I did, and I made the charts, and I showed them the apples and the oranges and the price differences on coffee. And they said, you're absolutely right. You know, we're marketing guys. We don't understand this stuff. So this is what they give us. We make a marketing program out of it, but we're not going to misrepresent like this. So they withdrew the claim they were making. So I thought, David beats Goliath. Okay, they can respond. Felt really good about it until six months later where they came right back out with the same marketing campaign. So with these big guys, it's often very hard to overcome the, the marketing 
uh, inertia, the, the, uh, the energy of their marketing departments, which are about sales, not about representing the product truthfully, right? Uh, that's, that's, we're going to talk about that in the business school talk tomorrow. Um, okay, so that's, that's basically how the, the, how the money piece works. Um, but I, I need to tell you that that fair trade minimum, even the seven cents extra and stuff, is not what real fair traders pay. I want to give you an example. Last year, when the, uh, the fair trade minimum was $1.60 and the world market price was about $1.40, I'll share with you some of the prices we paid for coffee. We paid $1.99 for Colombian, $2.20 for uh, Ethiopian, $2.05 for Timor. We got a really great coffee from Timor and 185 from Peru. So those are the prices we were paying. So when, when, when people who don't know anything about fair trade often say, if you go into a cafe and say, well, do you have any fair trade coffee? Sometimes they'll say, we don't do fair trade because we pay more than fair trade prices. A, they're talking about what they pay to the broker. So we already know that's totally irrelevant. And B, they're probably referring to the fair trade minimum, which no serious fair trader pays. The big companies, one of which plus sells coffee here. Um, the big companies who have, say, 3% fair trade or 7% fair trade, they pay the minimums because fair trade to them is another coffee on the shelf. It's not an ethical underpinning. I said to the guys at Starbucks when they, you know, they have a 3% fair trade, I said, well, so basically what you're saying is you get a room of 100 farmers and you say, you, you, and you, we're going to give you high prices. The other 97, take a hike, because we're only 3% fair trade, so we're only going to give three of 100 farmers a fair price. And even though Starbucks is by far the largest importer of fair trade coffee in the world, it's still only 3% of their business, which I've said, can, that kind of model, you know, it's, Nell Newman said to me once when I had a very nasty argument with her, she said, well, Dean, you see the glass is half full, and I see the glass is, you see the glass is half empty, I see the glass is half full, something like that. And I said, now, the farmers who deal with Starbucks, the glass is 97% empty. There's, <laughs> there's no way around that, you know? <laughs> yes, it's good, and, and some farmers are getting more, and that's really wonderful, but the truth is, when you use a model like that for social justice, when you allow it to be commodified like that, what are you doing? You're condemning that 97% to never participate in, in a socially just trade network because there's really no incentive for those large companies to do more than do enough to shut up the activists and confuse the consumers. Plain and simple. There's a bunch of Starbucks are opening up in, in Montreal and we have friends up there because we're in a, a, a coffee cooperative of roasters ourselves we started 10 years ago to, to buy fair trade coffee collectively. And they were very excited because they said, oh, there's going to be a new cafe opening here in, in Montreal and the signs all over the window say fair trade coffee coming soon. So they were very excited and it opened up and it was a Starbucks. And they went inside and said, what, do you have fair trade coffee? And they said, no, but it's coming. So, you know, they, they know what they're doing with marketing. And they, they, I, I, they don't do this stuff accidentally. Okay, so on top of that, we also have a profit sharing program at Dean's Beans. We have a profit sharing program with all our employees. Since the farmers supply us with the raw material that makes our lives what they are, we have the same profit sharing program with the farmers. It works like this. Every time we buy a, a pound of coffee from Peru, we pay the price we're going to pay. We roast the coffee and sell it. From the sales price, we take six cents and we put it in a fund marked Peru. Every year, we take the number of coffee pounds we bought in Peru uh, and sold from Peru, multiply it times six, and that's the money that goes back to the coffee cooperative in Peru we work with. We actually work with two cooperatives. Same in Rwanda, same in Ethiopia, same in Sumatra. Bup, 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 bup. So every year, we deliver a profit share, which generally ranges, depending on how much coffee we buy from a cooperative, somewhere from five to $10,000. Doesn't seem like a lot, but the things that the farming communities have been doing with it are extraordinary. In Peru, this cooperative in Peru, um, they funded the women's loan program. It had been on the books for five years, but there was never any money for it. So they took the 8,000 bucks the first year and put it in the women's loan fund. The very first woman who took a loan used it to put her son in college. The first kid in, in Pangoa Cooperative, 280 families in Peru, to ever go to college. That was about five, five years ago. I was there last month, 
and Emerson, the boy, just graduated from law school. So, you know, that money had made a profound impact on his life. And his mother paid back the loan, I should say. Uh, and he's the first, not only first college graduate, but first lawyer to graduate in, the, you know, in that region, in that small region in Peru. Other farmers have used it for wonderful things, from building warehouses in Mexico, because they needed to, to house the coffee, to a, a wonderful composting operation. If you go on YouTube, you can see the YouTube video that the farmers produced to send to me to show me what they did with the profit share. They created a composting operation. They use it for themselves, and they sell it outside of the co-op to make money. So, you know, exciting, creative things get done. So that's, that's the pricing piece. The most important part of what we do, though, I believe as social change agents, lies in the third leg. And that is what we call people-centered development. So we're going to hit, hit a different slide. You've seen these guys enough. Okay. People-centered development is basically coffee kids on steroids. It's the coffee kids model, but it's housed in a for-profit business. Great. And it's housed in a for-profit business. It isn't charity. I see our people-centered development as an integral part of the price of coffee, a fair reflection of the price of coffee. So what do we do? We go into every community that we buy from, and it's not just we do one over here, we do one over there. It's not that we give money to CARE or to Bono or anything like that. We work directly with the farmers as follows. Go ahead, next. We work directly with the communities. We do not work with outside organizations. This is very, very critical for empowerment purposes of the purple people we're working with, for organizational purposes, um, for the impact of the money because it's going directly to the communities. For many, many reasons, we work directly with the communities. Next. Very simple model, the model we pioneer to Coffee Kids. We go into the villages. We don't go in with a cookie cutter. We don't go in and say, hi, we give farm implements. We're care. Hi, we do child sponsorship and chicken programs. We're Save the Children or Child Reach International, which used to be called Foster Parents Plan, but they changed the name because um, people thought foster parents meant they stole the children. It was a problem. It was a real problem in Guatemala. And so they changed the name to Child Reach International, which I thought was pretty stupid because now you're reaching for the child instead of fostering the child. <laughs> Whatever. You know, they need a marketing department. Okay. So we, we listen to the folks and find out what their developmental priorities are, what's holding them back. Go ahead. Then what we do, which for me is the most fun, is we facilitate program design. So what does that mean? If people say, you know, there's no school here. Okay, well, how are we going to make education happen in this community? Or, you know, there's, there's no health care for 100 miles. There's no doctors, there's no nurses, there's no cl health clinics, there's nothing. We need health training or education or something here. Okay, well, how can we create something that's going to work? But the keys are, how are we going to create something that's going to work that the community is going to run? We're not bringing in outside organizations. The community owns and operates every program that we create together. That's critical, okay? And by doing so, what does that mean? The program really takes root in the community. People feel a sense of ownership. I can tell you from years of working with development organizations, you wonder why, since the 1960s, we've given $600 billion of development aid around the world. Where is it? What's going on? Why is poverty coming back you know, uh, stronger than ever in many places around the world? Real dire less than a dollar a day poverty. Well, a large part of it is the way that aid, aid programs are structured. And um, by bringing in these organizations where people are paid tons of money and they got cars and they, they stay there for two years and they leave, what happens after that? I asked the people from uh, Save the Children on my very first trip to Guatemala, we looked at a project and I said, well, what happens here when you leave? Because you said this is a two-year project. What happens after you leave? Well, we go to another village and we do this and get more pictures of kids. I said, okay, well, but what happens to the villagers that you just left? What happens to the chicken project? And they said, we don't know. I said, well, don't you care? Don't you, no, CARE is the other organization. Don't you want to save the children? What, don't you care what goes on here? And they said, well, we don't have money in our budget to go back and check what happened after we left, because that's not what we do. We do the project, we move, we do the project. I call that slash and burn development, basically. So um, 
We don't do that. We build projects with the community that they co-design and it's embedded and controlled by them. We may have to bring in technical people, maybe uh, accountants. We have sent college students to teach Excel spreadsheets, think about that, to, to coffee cooperatives or bring down programs that they don't have that can help in business or accounting or, um, or ways of controlling um, you know, costs and inputs and things. Um, there's that, that kind of training. Uh, I'll talk in a minute about a uh, project in Guatemala. We brought in uh, microloan people to teach the people how to run their own bank. Not to control them and be a bank on top of them, but for them to run the bank. Uh, the funding, we don't go to USAID like Starbucks and get $500,000 and build processing plants in Costa Rica and then say, we built processing plants when in fact they didn't, you did with your tax dollars. We, you know, we don't go to AID, we don't go to the church, we don't go to anybody. The money for these development programs comes out of our cash flow, comes out of our profit, and when required, comes out of Dean's Home Equity Loan. Because our commitment is, this is part of our business model. It's not a one-off charity. This is an essential part of who we are as a business. Okay? So, let's look at some of the projects. In Guatemala, lots of interesting things, but in Guatemala, we were met with the problem of health. So there's these 44 indigenous women who formed a health commune, a health collective, but they couldn't get training and they kept looking for grants. And when I met with them, they said, well, give us a grant so we can get someone down here to train us. And I said, you know, the problem with living on grants in the international development world is grants are fickle. This month, everybody wants to wear indigenous clothing from Guatemala, so you buy the clothing and the money supports the thing. But next month, that Tibetan stuff looks pretty cool. So you go over and you buy something from Tibet and you give money to save Tibet. Then something happens in Haiti and everybody forgets about Guatemala and, and, and Tibet and funds Haiti. And then they go someplace else. So not that it's ill-intentioned, but it doesn't work as a sustainable model in the long haul. So how can we help 44 illiterate indigenous women to have some kind of self-sustaining healthcare program? This is what we did. We took a microloan bank, uh, a revolving loan village bank, and we married it with the concept of healthcare training. So that every woman who got healthcare training was eligible for a loan. Every woman who signed up to get the healthcare training was eligible for a loan. The loan, then she generates income. You know how these things work. She generates income, and every month or two months or three months, we had a very unique program for that, they pay back a piece of the principal of the loan. They pay back a savings component so that each of the 44 women has, for the first time in her life, a savings account and is actually saving money. Really fascinating. And then the third component is the interest payment. This is the dirty little secret about microloans and why they're starting to crash a bit around the world. It goes like this. Microloans generally require a mid-level organization to come in from the outside and administer the loan. So the women get the loan, they report to the mid-level organization, and they then pay back the principal, pay the savings component, and the interest goes to the mid-level organization, which uses it for its own administrative purposes. That's fine, but the interest rates are pretty high, and that money's being sucked out of the community, because that group is not, that mid-level group is not from the community. So we said, well, that's kind of dumb. Why don't we empower the women to run their own bank? So we went to a great organization in Guatemala that does microloans called MUDE, Mujeres en Desarrollo, Women in Development, and we said to Adriana, the wonderful woman who's in charge of it, Latina woman, upper class woman, powerful woman, we said, you know, Adriana, we'd really like you to teach these women to run the bank. We'd like to contract you to teach these women how to run a bank. And she said, absolutely not. I said, why, competition? You know, what's the problem? She goes, I'm Latina. We don't work for indigenous women. Indigenous women work for us, which was very revealing. She said it very plainly. So he said, but Adriana, your role is to help women become empowered through these banks. And she said, we, don't, <laughs> we simply don't work for indigenous women. You don't get it. So he said, well, you know, you can either not work with us or whatever. So we went back and forth, and, and she did finally agree to a contract. So she was on a four-month contract to teach the women how to set up and run a program. And boy, was it funny, those first couple of meetings, because the women were like, yeah, now we got a chance to speak what we want to say to someone who we've never been able to speak to before because of the, the, um, 
the eth uh, ethnic hierarchies in, uh, in Guatemala. So it was a very empowering experience for the women. So here's the interesting thing. We took that, we took that, uh, that interest payment, and instead of giving it to Mude after Adriana had trained the women on how to run it, we took that, that interest payment and sequestered it in a fund, and it kept growing and growing. It took about four years, but after four years, the fund of interest payments was so big that it was enough to fund all the expenses of the healthcare program, to get nurses in and get doctors in, to do trainings, to create manuals in, in Mayan with pictures and stuff, which we still have, I'll give you a copy of, great, great healthcare manuals, um, to pay the women to go out to the villages and train other women, to buy kits for every one of the women. It became the world's first self-funding women's healthcare program. It ran for eight years, totally funding itself. And then, like businesses all over the world, or like governments all over the world, it got a little too big. So the first 44 women decided, this is such a good thing, let's expand it. So they expanded it to other villages, and they got to about 140 women. And then the women on the fringe, who weren't from the same ethnic group, said, we don't have to pay them back. And so they eventually collapsed back in. And the same women are there today, and they're still doing their thing, and they're still supporting themselves, but they, uh, they had to collapse the size of it. Anyway, the first self-funding healthcare program in the world, uh, women's healthcare program, very proud of that. Um, I'll go through some of them faster. I think you get the idea. In, in Nicaragua, the farmers identified landmines as a major issue because of the Contra Wars in the, in the 70s and 80s. The US government funded the Contras to put lots of landmines in uh, mines in the harbors of Managua, mines in the, in the fields. And the, the brilliant Contras said, well, since the Nicaraguan army is going into the coffee fields to help pick the crop, to help do the harvest at harvest time, uh, why don't we put the mines in the coffee fields? Because that's where the soldiers are going to be. So they did. So the funny thing about mines, the sad thing about mines is 20, 30 years later, they're still active. In fact, last year, a guy in Ethiopia got his leg blown off by a landmine that the Italians had planted in World War II. They're still active. So there are hundreds of thousands of mines in Nicaragua. In Angola, which has two million people, there are six million landmines. So that inhibits people from working in, in the mountains, in the coffee fields in Angola. So in Nicaragua, we said, well, how are we going to deal with this? So we partnered with an organization that specifically does disabilities rights and services. We don't. Uh, called uh, Polis Center, or Walking Unidos is the Nicaraguan uh, counterpart, and they built a prosthetic clinic. The prosthetic clinic gives free prosthetics and therapy to landmine victims, and rural poor, not just landmine victims. We created a cafe roastery. And there's a cafe roastery on every corner in, 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 in Indiana, right? Every corner in New York is a cafe with a little roasting machine in it. That's pretty standard. Well, this is the first one in, in Central or South America when we built it uh, 10 years ago. So the idea was that all the proceeds, all the profits from the cafe would fund the prosthetic clinic. And anybody who graduated, any adult who graduated from the prosthetic clinic with prosthesis and therapy, if they wanted to stay in Leon, where the project is, they could get a job at the cafe. High pay, high visibility, which is essential for uh, normalization of disabilities, cr critical issue and disabilities rights movement. And uh, at last count, of the eight people in the cafe, six of them are landmine victims. You saw one, Dennis, I don't know if you noticed the roaster, he had one arm. He's the only one-armed coffee roaster in the world. He blew his hands off making a bomb. He was on the other side. But, you know, we're equal opportunity employers, so in a place like Nicaragua, where healing the wounds of war is, is so, such a national priority, uh, we don't turn anybody away. Go ahead. In Mexico, you saw, you saw these guys. There's a thing called a death train. I don't know if any of you saw a movie that came out last year called Sin Nombre, okay? Sin Nombre is a, is a, a dramatization of what these guys are really going through, and I've spent a lot of time working down there. When I saw that movie, I broke out in a cold sweat. It was so real. My wife turned to me and said, that's where you go? What are you, an idiot? I said, maybe, because it's scary with the gangs. Anyway, what happens is all of, all of people who are trying to immigrate illegally into the United States, come up through Latin America, come through Central America, and there's a bottleneck at the, at the Guatemalan-Mexican border, right? Guatemala, Mexico, United States. 
There are a number of small towns along there that are freight depots, and one of them is Tapachula. So in Tapachula, this huge freight train, which is alternatively known as La Bestia, the beast, or El Tren de Muerte, the, the death train. It's owned by a Connecticut company, by the way, and that's, uh, you know, that's a good piece of activism. We, we, we pounded on those guys. But, so the, the train backs up to the border and, and carries cement, oil, and some other things, but it also carries every night hundreds and hundreds of illegal immigrants trying to go north so they can then earn money and send it back to their families. But what happens? They're hanging on to the top of this train. You saw me, you saw the train. You also saw me talking to a number of guys. It was a pouring rainstorm that night, and these guys were gonna climb up on top of this train for the 15-hour ride north. They fall asleep and fall off. They slip because, you know, it's wet. Uh, the goddamn guy who drives that train every now and then jerks it to make the train go like this and knock people off. Uh, the company said they told him not to do it, but he still does it. Often the gangs come on board and they rape women, they steal all the money and toss people over the side. So the train is going very fast. If you're thrown off, you're lucky if you die. But what generally happens is you fall down and the vortex of the speeding train sucks people under and that's why they lose their limbs. Then they're laying on the tracks. The next day the police drive up and down these tracks, they find these guys or women they take them and they dump them in a hospital and I've been in a number of those hospitals when these people wake up the next day. They're on a train, the next thing they know they're in a bed with no legs and, and what's going on and who the hell's the white guy? It's, you know, it's tr incredibly traumatic. So, so what I found out is because of that coffee crisis, pricing crisis I was talking about when we were drinking the coffee and driving people into poverty, a million coffee farmers lost their land. There's only 28 million coffee farmers in the world. A million of them lost their land. And where did they go? They became an, uh, economic refugees. Many of them flooded north through Latin America and tried to come into the United States. You may remember hearing reports about those vans in the Texas desert with 30 dead people in them. A lot of those are coffee farmers. I did the research uh, along the uh, Arizona and, and uh, Texas border to document that. So we set up a program, again, with prosthetics and therapy, but also job training uh, career track training and placement so that the folks could go back to their home countries and support their families. It's the only successful reintegration program around. They can't go to the United States. They don't have legs. There's no way to get north. They can't stay in Mexico. Why? They're illegal immigrants in Mexico. The Mexicans don't want them. The kids can't go to school because they're illegal immigrants. The people can't work. They're stuck in limbo. The only thing they can do is go back home but they're in such shame because they're not being able to support their families, they don't want to go. So our program helps people overcome that, get job skills, we place them, and they're able to get back to work. I'll just do a couple more and this is it. Peru, incredible reforestation programs, large scale um, economic development programs in Peru in the 70s and early 80s deforested tons of the central selva. Well, the farmers that we work with, the Ashaninkas in that area, said if we could only reforest our lands, then we could have our medicinal crops, we could have our food crops, we could hunt, and, and, and spiritually and psychologically we'll be whole again because we're responsible for these forests and they've been taken away from us. That has meaning. It's like your church burned down. So we started this program um, of reforestation and we tied it into our CO2 reporting for the UN Global Compact. So basically, we calculated the carbon load of coffee from the farmer through shipping, through roasting, through this and that. And we said, okay, well, how much carbon is generated by that chain and how, much, uh, how many hardwood trees that the farmers determine which kind because it's their forest, how many hardwood trees does it take to offset the carbon generated by a pound of coffee? So we started funding trees and that, meant not, and that meant not going to trees for the future in Washington, D.C., which you give money to, and they do exactly what they said they're going to do. They're going to plant trees for the future. They're not going to plant them now. They're going to plant them in the future. Very bizarre. People think they're like overcoming CO2, and they're not, because these programs are in the future. Anyway, this program is in the now. Our first year, we had 800 trees. Five years later, there's over 100,000 trees. I was there a couple weeks ago, and what you see is kind of like scrub in the background is totally verdant tropical forest again. So it's a great program. 
We also have the women's loan programs we've talked about, latrine programs where they have nicer bathrooms with septic systems than we have in Massachusetts, um, a number of really great programs in Peru. We have a cafe roastery in Peru so they can sell for local consumption and a, whole, and a daycare program so that the women can participate in the meetings um, and not worry about the kids. Next. Ethiopia, everywhere we went, water, water. That's what the Ethiopian farmers wanted. There's no water in Ethiopia except dirty water and very far away. So we started a program called Miriam's Well. Great marketing. Miriam is the biblical prophetess that everywhere she went in the desert, she could find water. Well, between the, the Coptic Christians and the, the, the Muslims who we work with, everybody recognizes Miriam as a prophetess, so good marketing. So Miriam's Well Revolving Loan Fund, first revolving loan fund for wells in the world, goes like this. We gave a grant of $10,000 to, to the secondary co-op, that's the manager co-op, and there are co-ops in all the small villages. They lend the money to a village. The village water committee builds the well themselves and hires the technique, tech, uh, technicians to do it. They then manage it. They pay back the loan back to the, to the um, secondary co-op, a penny a pound at harvest, no interest. When the loan is replenished, it rotates and goes to the next co-op. Build the well, repay, replenish, et cetera, et cetera. So just like Miriam, we keep finding water in the desert of, of Ethiopia through a revolving loan fund, and it's a great program. So in our very first well, 3,000 people for the first time in history got clean water. Why is that essential? Many reasons. The Muslims say now we can pray properly because without clean water we can't pray. We felt dirty, we felt like we weren't doing our proper ablutions under our, our, our spiritual path. For the kids, a little more practical perhaps, the kids are not going to school and they're not concentrating. Why? They have stomach illnesses. Within three months of this first well opening up, stomach illnesses pretty much disappeared from Haro, the community that this is in. So now the kids can go to school, they can concentrate, they can do their homework. The women, um, the women in Haro had to walk a, a, about three quarters of a mile down a hill to get to a, a stream to get water, polluted by agricultural runoff, cows. So then they have to turn around and carry these Pennzoil cans, jerry cans, back up the hill three quarters of a mile or so and maybe do it twice a day. So not only did we save about three hours a day of women's labor, but also these things, water weighs eight pounds a gallon. So if you got five gallons, that's 40 pounds. If you got two of them, that's 80 pounds. That's a lot of water to carry and a lot of back problems for women as they were getting older, the cumulative impact of, of carrying that weight on their back. So Miriam's Well, a great success. We got an award from the United Nations for that. One more. Um, Timor. Funding health care, alternative crops, because malnutrition is rampant in Timor. Uh, farmers, you'd think farmers would know what to grow. They don't have the nutritional information to know what to grow. So we've brought in all sorts of interesting alternative crops from Southeast Asia, and it's a great program. Next, I'll go through these fast. Sumatra, the farmers came up with the idea that a water buffalo manufactures enough feces and urine in one year to fertilize a hectare of land, which is the average size holding of a, of a, a Sumatran coffee farmer. So we funded a program to bring water buffalo, which are really in rice paddies and lowlands, up into the mountains to work with coffee farmers. Uh, three conditions. The first is the first buffalo got named Pamandin, which means Uncle Dean in Bahasa Indonesian. <laughs> Second, that for the first six months they would monitor Pamandin very closely, following him around and making sure he was doing what he was supposed to do, and, and seeing whether or not there was a true impact on the quality and the quantity of the coffee using this natural input. And third, after six months, I would go to Indonesia, we would have a meeting, look at all the information, and if Pamandin was doing his thing, we would fund more water buffalo, and if Pamandin wasn't doing his thing, then we would have a festival and eat Pamandin. <laughs> so uh, I went, we had a great program, everything worked out well, we determined that we were gonna fund the program. Half the people in the audience cheered and the other half went, ah, because they were kind of looking forward to eating the buffalo. Uh, now there are 30 Pamandine and we only funded five. Why is that a self-sustaining program? Don't you know anything about agriculture? Okay. There are 30 Pamandines because they're self-generating at this point. They keep making their own little Pamandines. And they attribute that to my fecundity, but I told them, <laughs> not really. It's all about the buffalo. It has nothing to do with me. Uh, a very successful program uh, on eco-management. Papua New Guinea, I'll, I'll make this, uh, this and one more. 
Papua New Guinea, the farmers we work with are so far away from roads. You saw pictures of three people carrying back uh, coffee on their back. They, that's one of the close places. They have to go eight to 10 hours over the mountain and down to a road and wait for some pickup truck to come by and buy their coffee. No good. These people live in the central highlands so far away there are no roads, period. There are no roads to these communities. So I said to them, why doesn't the government build some roads out here? And they said, if the government built roads, the farmers would drive down the roads and burn down the capital. So the government's not going to invest in roads. So it's a fractious society of 846 different tribes, different languages. Really interesting place to work. So what these people have to do is they have to bring their coffee to airstrips. There are 14 airstrips along the central highlands in, in this area of Papua New Guinea. So they have to bring their coffee to airstrips and wait for airplanes from the Mission Air, Missionary Aviation Fellowship, MAF, to come by, drop off the evangelicals and their Bibles, and pick up the coffee. Well, that's kind of good because the MAF transports the coffee and then the farmers get paid, except that the MAF charges 50 cents a kilo to transport the coffee. And that's kind of what the farmers make. So at the end of the day, it's really not much of a proposition economically for the farmers. Worse than that, when they're up in the mountains waiting for those planes to come, if a cloud cover comes in, the planes don't come. So the coffee farmers are sitting there with the bags of cherries, the unprocessed coffee, waiting for the planes. And the coffee is doing what? It's rotting because it starts fermenting the minute you take it off the vine. So we said, how do we prevent the rotting? How do we increase the quality of the coffee? And how do we try to save some money so these people are making more money? So we came up with the idea of these hand depulping machines. They cost 250 bucks. So for $3,000 for 14 airstrips, we got this thing covered. So now when the people are waiting for the airplanes, they're sitting there and processing their own coffee and drying the coffee. What that does is it, it, it takes two thirds of the weight away. So now they're paying a lot less to transport their coffee, which means they're keeping more of the, of the downstream income. And um, also the coffee's not rotting because once it's in this form, it, start, it stabilizes because they start drying it. So a very creative solution on how to deal with the issues at hand. I'll do one more. Keep going. Nope. Now. This one's very personally important to me. When I started doing work in Rwanda and I canvassed this kind of, you know, like what's, what's holding you back? What are the issues here? Everybody said, you know, we're doing all right economically now. We're starting to come back, but we have violence, especially gender violence, deep in our society and we really need to get rid of it. So what can we do about that? Well, uh, I've been involved in men's work for a long time and, and had some experience in overcoming violence. So went back to the States, found some great organizations and we went over there and in our first training program, 15 men, 15 women, coffee farmers, we did a week long training on overcoming gender violence. Powerful, powerful stuff. At the end of which, um, it was amazing things were coming out. At the end of which, we had a big ceremony and there were hundreds and hundreds of villagers around this big field and in the middle, the men would come one by one and apologize to the women for the violence that they brought into their lives. And the women victims of violence would step up face to face with the men and accept their apology. And then the people just would scream and it was just beautiful. It was the most powerful thing I've ever seen. So what happened from that is now these 15 men and 15 women are going to other cooperatives around Rwanda to train other coffee farmers in the overcoming violence techniques that we used in the workshops. And um, it, uh, the, the UN and the Norwegian government are paying for that. So it's, it's really taking on a life of its own and having a major impact in Rwanda, so I'm very proud of. So, next. So, I think we've shown, and I've, I've tried to get to tonight, is that business can be a force for social good, it can be a force for positive social change, and still be positive, and still be um, profitable. Um, so, as you're going forth in your business lives, or you're dealing with businesses, you can make the same demand because until business changes its fundamental operating principle and incorporates more human dignity, human rights, and the value of, of both uh, ecology and human society, uh, we're still gonna be in the same mess. But there are ways out, and we're among the, the small but powerful group of people out there who are making that change. So 
Uh, thanks for having me. I'll stick around if anybody wants to and talk some questions. I'll also be here all day tomorrow going to various classes, but I hope this has been a bit inspiring for you uh, as it's been for me. So thank you very much. That's it. Why not? Take at least uh, 10 minutes or so for if anybody has a What are you going to go out and drink? Come on, stick around and ask questions. Um, yeah, if you can speak up really loudly, otherwise I don't think I can get this mic to you. Yeah, you, you talked a, a lot of, you made a lot of points, but I'm wondering if you can sort of summarize in a handful of points on what you think uh, makes a microloan or a charitable organization sustainable. Um, I'm thinking in terms of like, you alluded to the idea that if, if it grows too big, it collapses or it gets corrupt or something like that. Can you, can you sort yeah. of? Uh, yes, yeah. The key to success in, in the microloan industry when it was a lot smaller was simply that there was buy-in in the community. And when those programs expanded beyond a community that had a certain social cohesion, that's when they start failing because people don't feel that they owe anything to the group. So. To translate that into other words, um, buy-in, community buy-in. The community must feel that it owns the program, that it's not being forced on them, and it's not going to be taken away from them. But rather, it's their program, they own and operate it, and then they will invest their energy into making it happen, even through rough times. I've seen a lot of development programs where people walk away when things get tough because they're not really vested in it. But with these folks, nobody's walking away. So I think that the key point is buy-in. I mean, that might sound a little too sociological for an economist, but it's the truth. It's the, it's the one social dynamic that's at the key to any successful development program, whether it's small scale or large scale. Um, you, you made a statement that I, I, I love the way you said it was coffee on a shelf versus uh, an effort, ethical underpinning of your organization. Right. And I can see where in your organization it's built into the DNA. It, it's Absolutely. From day one, this is how we are. That's the point. How does a massive organization, let's pretend Starbucks or any other. Oh, sure, a publicly held how, organization. How it, Absolutely. How does it transform, or do you even think it's possible? It's all that you know what? For pre existing large publicly held corporations, it's almost impossible. For a startup of any size, it's entirely possible. And here's why. One of, the, one of the things we learn in business school is that the uh, primary obligation of the directors and the management is to maximize shareholder profit, right? Everybody knows that. You know, you bob your heads like you're in the back of a car. Well, that's not true. It's not the law, and it's certainly not the ethics. The law requires that the board of directors and the managers maximize shareholder value, not profit, value. That's the law. So the question is, what's, what is value to a corporation? That is defined by the Articles of Incorporation, by the Board of Directors. That's what we're talking about. So for a large pre-existing corporation, yeah, profit is the primary value. The head of P&G, uh, Procter & Gamble, I was on a board with him once and he said, well, this is all crap. He said, the only obligation of a business is to make money for its shareholders. I'm like, okay, that's what you think. And that's your business model. I got a different business model. And a lot of people now are starting to form a different view. I saw an article in The Economist a couple of weeks ago, which I highly recommend to anybody who's interested in these issues. I read it every week. The Economist, there was an article in there talking about the need to get away from profit maximization to, val to go towards value maximization. And when The Economist starts talking like that, you know it's getting somewhere. I felt very good about that. It was an Indian economist, too. Who made, the, who made this statement. So um, for a pre-existing large-scale organization, it's hard because people are already in there looking for profit, pension funds especially, who are the large-scale investors. However, when a corporation starts out and says, these are our values, we're a triple bottom line corporation, yes, we're going to try to maximize profit, but not at the expense of the third world sourcing ecology or the health of the communities we buy from. We're not going to do profit on the backs of people to the point where it injures either their air, water, their food, or their, or their communities. So we're going to balance that. We're going to give up a little of this to get that. So if you start like that, there's a sufficient investment community out there right now who's willing to say, I'll vote my dollars there. 
We get calls all the time by angel investors who want to come in because they agree that our set of values is the right way to go. There are conferences all year long on, uh, on um, institutional investors and regular investors who want to put money into socially responsible businesses. It's a really growing part of, of the investment community right now. So dinosaurs, what happens to dinosaurs? They die. I think what happens is the large scale organizations that live purely on profit, you know, it, they're going to be doing this up and down thing like they're doing now. They'll live and die on profit. But the new organizations that are coming up now, even the large scale technological ones, you know, the new Googles, the new companies coming up, are, have a, a, a very different view. And so I think that's, that's the trend to look towards and not spend tons of energy trying to get the big ones to do anything more than limit the damage that they do under their shareholder profit model. Yeah. And Starbucks tries. I mean, I, I have a lot of friends in the higher ups of Starbucks um, before I was quoted in the newspaper saying something stupid about them and they s closed all the doors to me. But shy of that, I used to go and, I used to go and lecture at the mothership in Seattle every year um, uh, for, for, the, for the employees. But um, even Starbucks tries within the context of that they're a profit machine, they try to do some good things as long as it doesn't interfere with the profit. <laughs> but when that balance is, is reached, then, you know, then a whole, whole new world is possible and that's what's coming up. Okay? Right there. Yeah. Okay. That's a Yeah, that's a great question. The first half of it is you work in all these indigenous communities. How the heck do you communicate with them if they don't speak Spanish? I speak Spanish, Portuguese, Japanese. I'm working on Indonesian, but none of those are the languages we're talking about. So here's what I do. Obviously, there's somebody who intermediates. So when I go to Latin America, I speak Spanish to everybody and then they translate it into the indigenous languages, we're, you know, that's that's the way that works. Um, Interestingly enough, I, I, I have to segue because I always screw up. When I was uh, here in, in, in Papua New Guinea, I gave a speech be, before 7,000 people in a field. Biggest audience I ever had in real life, and half of them were naked because it's a, you know, an interesting culture. So I was giving the talk and I thought, well, I'm gonna, like I always try to do, I try to give a, a short speech in the local language. I learn it online, I call the embassies, I call universities where there's people who speak the language, and I say, teach me how to translate this little speech I want to give because I want to show respect to the people I'm working with. Nobody from Starbucks does that. So when I go into a community and I can throw some words in pidgin English or a takpisan as it's called in Papua New Guinea or ashaninkas or oromifa, when I can give a little speech of welcome, even though it's kind of screwed up, it's so greatly appreciated. It shows my respect for the people there and that starts our relationship off on a very good foot. Well, when I was talking to those people in the field, it was time to end the talk. So I thought, well, I'll do it and talk pissing because I know how to say this. It's now me talk, talk, uh, now my speech is finished. And I know how to say that. I said, okay, now me talk, talk penis. And I thought, you know, I'd get the applause and everything. And 7,000 people are staring at me. So I turned to Iggy, who's from there, the translator, and I said, Iggy, what's going on? He goes, well, you just said, I'm going to talk about my penis. <laughs> and I said, no, I said, me talk to penis. And he said, penis finished, penis finished. He goes, no, it's, it's penis, it's not penis. He said, you know, I said, well, what do I do now? And he said, well, you have two choices. He said, I got to tell you, he said, nobody in this crowd has ever seen a white man's penis. <laughs> so you could show them your penis and it would be a great thing. Or I can say what Dean meant to say is my talk is finished. I said, how about you say the talk is finished, you know? Because I'm just thinking, my, I can just hear my wife when I get home. Honey, you're not going to believe what I did. You're going to love this one. So Iggy gets up and says what Dean really meant was his talk is finished. And again, I hear like from half the crowd, ah, <laughs> that's pretty funny. So things like that happen. But it's the point of trying and showing respect that's the more important, the more significant thing. Not that I can have business negotiations in Tokpisan, okay? But it's a great point. Um, okay, last question. So you said something Uh, 
Uh, yes and no. I don't start a business, I start in, I gave a talk to a third grade class a couple of months ago and you know they got it. Because it was, it was like Earth Week, it was last year, you know, they, they, they so got this. And I, I speak in high schools all over the country. I want to get people before they become so enmeshed in the false notions of what business requires versus what culturally is, 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 is accepted in business now. You know, two totally different things. You know, I want to go to Chicago and kick Milton Friedman's grave, you know, dance on top of it. But no, so I speak in business schools all over the country. In the last couple of months, I've spoken in uh, University of Michigan, the Ross School of Business at uh, Michigan State. Um, Georgetown, Harvard. Um, I was at UMass Boston Business School and Northeast School of Business last week. So I, I'm, as, as Catherine said uh, in the introduction, a big part of our mission is education. And yeah, I really believe that people have to get disabused of the notion that business is a, a one-way thing. We win, they lose, profit is the most important thing. And that people become commodities because that's frankly what happens in this world of commodities. I gave a talk to um, the UN Human Rights uh, Commission and it was held at Harvard Business School two years ago. And I talked about the projects and how we see the commodities coming from communities and we really work to strengthen the communities. And in the audience, not even this big, the audience was Coca-Cola, General Electric, British Petroleum, Anglo-American, Rio Tinto Zinc, which is the most evil company, except for Freeport McMoran, and the other two evil companies in the world. Anyway, they were all there, all these major multinationals. And here's little Dean's Beans talking about this way of doing business. Afterwards, you could have heard a pin drop. The, the head of um, community outreach for Coca-Cola came up to me and she said, you know, we can make a great product, we can market it and distribute it around the world, but we don't know how to work with the communities where we source our raw materials. You know, what can we do? I said, you can come with me. I offer anybody who wants to pay their own way, you can come with me and see what we do and see if it, it's something meaningful for you. They never took me up on it. But in any event, we talked about it. What's the problem here? Why doesn't Coca-Cola take responsibility for the destruction of clean water in India where it sources so much of its clean water? Why doesn't Shell take responsibility or Texaco take responsibility for the pollution in, in Ecuadorian Amazon where I've worked with those communities? Why doesn't uh, Freeport McMoran take responsibility for its security guards pushing human rights activists out of helicopters? And it's largely not because they're real bastards, but because the people at the head office are so far removed from the actions of people buying commodities and processing things in their name that there's this total disconnect as human beings between our community and this community. And that's, that is just an essential piece of breakthrough that has to happen at business schools. And it's not gonna happen because people have to take one ethics course. I was talking to folks about that recently. The business professor saying, you know what? Segregate, it's like making fair trade a coffee over here. Oh, we're a company and we got, we got fair trade. See, we got it, it's right over there. You know, it's the same thing. We're a business school, we got an ethics course. It's right over there. No, when I met with uh, Northeast last, uh, last year, they met faculty from all the different schools and the point was how do you incorporate social justice into curriculum across the board? Not out there hanging out on its own for the weird kids, but you know, how do you integrate it into every course? And that's, that's the real challenge, especially in business schools. So yeah, it's a fool's errand right now, but it's great fun. So we'll see how it goes tomorrow, won't we? Okay. Well, one more round of applause for Dean. Thank you, thanks for coming, hanging out so long. the initial invitation to, to Dean. Uh, I, I, I think we could stay here for a few minutes if anyone didn't, want to, didn't have a chance to pose a question, but we are fairly soon going to whisk Dean off to a much deserved meal. I don't think he's had a proper meal today and have him sample some of the most sustainable <laughs> cuisine here in Bloomington, and also give you incentive to come tomorrow evening to Foster to have further discussion with him about these issues. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming.